on studying Atlantic sturgeon. And sturgeon are really cool because they've been around for so long. Um, they've been around for like a hundred million years. And sturgeon are considered living fossils because we don't see a lot of morphological and anatomical change throughout time. So a sturgeon back in the Cretaceous would look relatively similar to perhaps a sturgeon today. And those are some examples of Atlantic sturgeon on the left. And on the right, we see uh, examples of scoots. And scoots are essentially a calcified der dermal external plate that's present yeah, on the outside of the organism. And uh, sturgeon have five rows of scoots. So they have one dorsal row on the top, on the back of the organism, uh, two lateral rows on the sides, and then two ventral rows on the underbelly. And if you kind of look, you might see this really like cool little pattern, this funky little pattern with high points and low points. That's referred to as the ornament. And the ornament is kind of analogous to uh, fingerprints in humans. So you know how you'll never see two people with the same fingerprint? Well, in sturgeon, uh, you'll never see two scoots with quite the same ornament. So this variation is something that's just really cool to study. And uh, it's something that we can perhaps learn a little bit more about. And if you look at this little uh, ridge where the ornamentation stops, it's kind of hard to see on the top scoot. But if you look on the bottom scoot, you can see where it stops. And that's just because um, as sturgeon grow, the scoot is present from an early age. So they kind of grow like shingles like this. And so this uh, part where the ornament stops is the covered part. And as the organism grows um, and expands, it's kind of revealed. And one more important thing to note is this unornamented uh, area of the scoot that would actually be closer to the head, so anterior of the animal. And why are we interested in looking at scoots? Um, well, one reason, of course, is that surgeon are extremely economically important. The caviar industry alone internationally brings um, hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's not even including fishing or research. So it's just an important step to just learn and uh, expand our breadth of knowledge for these uh, creatures. And then secondly, um, we do not have a great understanding of phylogenetic change and relationships in this um, group. Uh, again, it's been around for 100 million years. And so there's a lot of different proposals and a lot of different research for how it's changed. Um, but we're still kind of narrowing it down and studying maybe this pattern in the ornament and the scoot shape would be um, just one more element that we can add to expand how uh, we're relating these creatures. And lastly, uh, sturgeon are not doing very well. The, of the 25 extant ta uh, taxa that we have, um, they are pretty much all threatened or endangered by humans. So learning anything about them right now while we still can is certainly important. And before I really go into what I did, um, I just want to establish some uh, baseline definitions. So in uh, morphometrics, we use something called landmarks. And these are anatomically apparent and recognizable places. Um, and most importantly, they can be repeated in all of our samples. And the reason we assign landmarks is as we are comparing different parts of, for example, the morphology, we can say, oh, from this part, uh, this is a label point. And as that changes, we can use that as a reference point to compare how uh, the morphology also changes. And then statistically, uh, a t-test, which is a statistical test that simply compares the two means of groups. And if you have a smaller p-value uh, below 0 0.05, you can determine that there is a statistical difference versus a larger p-value above that threshold uh, will not indicate that uh, same difference. And so um, I first wanna give a huge shout out to uh, my mentor, Eric, who because um, if we were not doing this virtually because of COVID, uh, I would have been digitizing these scoots myself, but he sent me all of our samples and we looked at, I believe nine specimens of Atlantic sturgeon. So I think it was about 80, 81 different scoots and it was, um, a lot of work and I definitely could not have done it without him. So I first want to give him a huge shout out. Um, so uh, remember we kind of talked about how uh, we had different series of scoots. So uh, surgeon again have five different rows, one dorsal row, two lateral rows and three, sorry, two ventral rows. And so uh, we kind of first separated them out and assigned landmarks. So these are examples a, of a dorsal scoot, a lateral scoot in the middle and a ventral scoot on the right. 
And these landmarks are essentially where we first started. When I first got a scoop, this is what I did. So landmark E, again, is most anterior to the head and landmark A would be uh, closer to the tail. And then landmark D kind of marks that point of between an unornamented area and an ornamented area. And then B and C, those landmarks just indicate the furthest points um, laterally from that scoot. And so I did this for all the scoots and there's a skill bar for, for reference. They're about you know 30 millimeters, a little less sometimes. Um, and from there, I use something called Fiji, which is an image processing software. And it's kind of similar to ImageJ. I don't know if a lot of you guys took intro bio, but we did use ImageJ there too. So it's very similar and it's really useful in working metrics. Um, from there, we can do things like measure lengths between angles, or sorry, measure lengths between landmarks, measure the angles, measure the area of the scoot, and do something called counting the ornament. And I'm going to uh, go a little bit into something called cells ornament. So if you look at um, the scoot, you can kind of see there's like low points surrounded by like a little ridge. That would be one cell. So one cell would be like a low point, for example. And from there, we did a lot of calculations. So I calculated a lot of ratios, like the unornamented area ratio to uh, the unornamented area, uh, scoot length to scoot width. And then you can calculate percentages, like the percent ornamented area and the ornament density. And all these I kind of put into a huge table and I was just making graphs and looking for patterns and seeing how the scoots within this one species uh, compared. And then I compared the uh, individual series to see how those compared as well. And we got a few results from this summer. So the first and probably um, most obvious result would be as your uh, ornamented area of a scoot increased, so did the ornament or cell count. And this, yeah, this makes sense because if you think about it, unless the uh, cell size or the ornament size is changing dramatically, you would expect that as you uh, have more ornamented area, you're gonna have um, more of this pattern. Um, but the cool thing that kind of complements this is that while that did increase, we do see a fairly consistent um, ornament or cell density with all these scoots. And it's really interesting because if you look at um, different species, we might not see the same threshold. So we saw um, a, an ornament density of 1.13 and 1.45. So those are kind of the boundaries. And um, other species that I'm looking at now don't have that same uh, ornament density. So it may be a cool thing because if we don't see, um, if we get it like it's fossil, for example, and we can't identify it, that's um, an element that we can use to better identify the uh, taxa. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, area. So uh, these graphs might be a little hard to understand. So if you look at the red parts, so D1, D2, D3, L1, L2, L3, and V1, V2, V3. So the red portions or the divorce portions indicate the dorsal part, uh, the dorsal series. And the L or the purple represent the lateral series and the V or the green represent the ventral series. And the one, two, three essentially means, so we're going from the anterior portion of the organism to the medial and that's two, and then three would be the posterior. And so as you progress through this series, in all three of these, you get this stark increase um, from the uh, scoot closest to the head to the medial scoot. And it's kind of unique in the ventral series because while the dorsal and lateral series did kind of go back down in terms of uh, average scoot area, the ventral series did continue to increase. So for the dorsal and lateral uh, series, we do kind of get this phenomenon where scoots are getting bigger up to a point and then they're decreasing in size whereas the ventral series, they just continuously got bigger on average. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about angles. So I don't know if y'all can see, but this is an angle um, ECA. And remember, E is the anterior portion of the scoot and A would be the posterior portion of the scoot. And the reason I focus on this specific angle is because um, the individual shape uh, between series is different. So if you look at uh, dorsal and lateral uh, scoots, they form based on a, a biological a blueprint sort of thing. So, but the ventral portion of the scoot does not form in conjunction with any biological footprint. So you can see uh, more commonalities within the dorsal portion of the series and the lateral portion of the series 
whereas the ventral series kind of the shape can range all over the place. And in this portion, we do see that in the dorsal and lateral series, the this angle does increase as you move through the series. Whereas if you look at the ventral portion of the series, this angle does decrease, which is something really interesting. And this last angle that we're focusing on is BEC. And essentially, if this angle were to increase, you're going to get a longer scoot uh, vertically than you would uh, horizontally. And again, we see this uh, kind of flip. So if you look in the uh, dorsal series and the lateral series, you're getting uh, more horizontally wide, so wider scoots as you move through the series, whereas you look at the ventral series in Atlantic Sturgeon, you kind of get a taller series. So that was a lot of results that I kind of just threw at you, but what are some takeaways that we can look at this? Well, the first and probably most important is the ornament density, so the amount of cells low points in an ornamented area is actually remarkably consistent and stable between the bounds of 1.13 and 1.45 cells per square millimeter. And this again is important because as we look through the fossil record, we might get uh, scoots that we can't identify which individual species these are. So just knowing the ornament density can be something that uh, is really beneficial in aiding our identification efforts. And secondly, there are measurable uh, statistical differences in scoot shape within each series which is something that we definitely, we knew that between series, there was a lot of variation, but prior to the study, we didn't know just how much we saw variation within a series. And the third conclusion, of course, is more research is necessary. And this is actually something that I'm continuous, uh, continuing now. So this uh, studies was intra-species specific. We only looked at Atlantic sturgeon. However, now I'm taking the results that I found and comparing it to other species that I'm looking at for my senior research. And that's in the process and I'll let you know how that goes. Um, but essentially that's all I have to say, except of course, thank you so much to Eric Hill and um